Um, as all you know, uh, this is uh, not even a, uh, I always say it's the short abbreviated LinkedIn resume. I don't know if this is even close to what it would properly be for Jeff. Uh, along with being an author, uh, writer on his blog, podcast host, uh, Jeff is a multiple NAGBW award winner, uh, including this past year for best blog for Birvana, as well as two uh, technical writing awards uh, for stories that he also posted on his blog at Birvana. Um, we've got a intimate group today, tonight to talk with Jeff. Um, I've got a lineup of questions, as I always do, um, but I will also emphasize I would love for you all to take this opportunity to pick Jeff's brain. Uh, we are going to be chatting about, uh, you know, the work that he put in to the book, The Beer Bible, the second edition, which is just out now. Uh, and I think there's a lot of things that are happening even just this week in beer that connect back to the history, culture, to tradition that Jeff writes about in the book. Um, so Jeff, with that said, uh, thank you very much for being here and letting us pick your brain and learn from your insights. Appreciate it. Indeed. Uh, yeah, and I just have to say, uh, winning the gold for blog, uh, since I self-identify as a blogger, I think there's like seven of us and I kept winning silver and it was killing me. I can now die. I feel like I won this thing no one else cares about, but man, it was killing me. So, uh, all right. Well, this, well hold this out. Is Let's, the highlight of my year. We're hoping for good, good health for at least the next 54 minutes. Uh, so, stick with us, Jeff. Um, no excitement. Um, all right. Jeff, I wanted, I wanted to start, talk with you first. Um, I think about just a couple of things that have come up this week in terms of more newsy things uh, in the beer world, because I think they do uh, connect directly to some of the work that you put into the book too. Um, namely, you know, Bell's announced its sale to uh, Lion Little World Beverages vis-a-vis -vis Kieran Holdings uh, just this week. And then just an hour ago or so, I was reading about uh, Stone, Brewer out in California, Stone, uh, which is continuing its effort to effectively rebrand itself as a lager brewery. Um, and both of these things in my mind connect to ideas of tradition and what tradition is in a contemporary sense, especially when we have these long tenured kind of iconic American craft breweries who are going through these changes uh, that we are all experiencing in real time. Um, so I mentioned those two examples to start us off talking about tradition. And in the context of this week's news, what does tradition mean when we look at what's happened with Bells, when, when we look at the way that stone is working to evolve itself to, to consumers as well? What is tradition in today's context? Do you mean in, in terms of breweries or beer or... I I was right with you until you asked that last question, and then you threw me. <laughs> yes, I think the I think the answer is is yes, um, both in terms of uh, breweries, but then also in a case of what the breweries are doing. So, we if we talk about tradition with Bells, there's obviously family there, but that is changing and evolving. If we talk about Stone, uh, which built itself on the idea of you know uh, of arrogant bastard and bitter IPAs, that is now changing. Uh, and, and to me, we often have these conversations that kind of circle around what tradition is and how that's continuing to evolve. And so from your vantage point, I think that's what I'm poking at a little bit is what all that means. Yeah, I mean, uh, in one way, I'm not at all surprised uh, to see these changes happening. Um, when, I, when I was doing the research for the Beer Bible, one thing that, um, you know, coming from the American context where we had all this excitement and all this independent ownership um, uh, breweries, uh, I, I kind of, you know, had gotten a little bit of a perverted sense of, of business and the way things work. And so when you travel around Europe, uh, family breweries uh, typically have been in the, the, you know, in the same family for generations. And it's really hard. And every time, um, you know, somebody reaches an age like Larry Bell reached, uh, there's an, there's an offer, there's a, this, this can happen, right? Like there's, uh, Laura decides she doesn't want to do it. 
Um, I don't actually know the story behind that, but um, that that succession plan fell through. Uh, people want to do other things, and so you know it's really hard to keep breweries and families. Um, uh, so uh, you know, on that score, I've been waiting for this this to happen for a long time because the United States now is uh, our our beer industry is forty years old, so a lot of these breweries are are passing on to the second generation or being sold or you know just closing up shop. Um, but in terms of the, the beer evolution, I, I think that's also totally predictable. I mean, uh, we have in the United States finally developed our own kind of way of brewing. Um, we figured out how to, how to work with our own American hops in a way that um, uses techniques that no one else ever has ever used before. Um, and so it's created this explosion of excitement in the industry and experimentation. Uh, and so you're seeing a lot of, uh, styles come and go week in and week out. Um, and with the explosion in breweries, that means there is, you know, a huge amount of, uh, products on the market and breweries that are doing well or poorly. So you're going to see, you know, you're going to see, uh, a lot of churn as far as all that goes too. And, you know, writing about the, uh, writing the beer bottle, I was compelled to, dig into my Ron Pattinson and Martin Cornell and other places and try to figure out, you know, what was beer like in the before times. And, you know, history is just littered with uh, styles that, that came and went um, during other periods of great ferment. So I think that the United States is in many ways, just kind of going through what the rest of the world had, had already been through for so long. Um, and it's not, not so surprising to me. I mean, that I think the one thing that's distinctive about, the uh, Bells thing is that uh, that's a brewery that basically never really kept up with the times. You know, they <laughs> they continued to uh, uh, sell this really antiquated IPA that uh, is 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 a, you know has a flavor profile that's fallen out of style in the United States and no one else can sell, um, and it's still growing. So that's super weird. Um, they've always been a unicorn in my mind. Um, and I think because of that, they're both really valuable. Uh, I would love to know the details and I don't know, maybe Kate or somebody else has wind of that, but, uh, um, it seems like it would be on the one hand, an extremely valuable property in the, in the craft brewing space because people are so devoted to it, uh, that they'll drink amber ales and old stouts and, uh, old IPAs. Um, but on the other hand, you know, do they care as much about those beers that's owned by Kieran? So. Um, these are, but these are, these are questions that I, I don't think are new to, to, uh, people who've been in the brewing industry, um, it, you know, in the modern era of, of commercial production. So. It, I, I want to, uh, connect that to something that you had shared on your blog on Beer Vana 2, uh, when you were getting ready to start your tour, you'd posted this kind of outlining, the changes in the second edition of the Beer Bible over the, the first one. Uh, it, there's, a, there's a collection of, of notable changes uh, you, you outline here, the structure. I want to maybe focus a little bit on the second part that you highlight in the, the what's in, what's out, um, because I don't know if this connects directly to what you were just talking about, but there is just in the time frame from first edition to second, Obviously, enough has changed in the world of beer to consider what functions best in terms of that educational guide. So when you were thinking about what had to change just as a matter of practicality in the years since the first edition came out, how did you go about choosing what was going to stay, what was going to go, and, and what needed to stick around? Yeah, it's, uh, it's really interesting to think about the evolution of beer, uh, which, you know, it, it, if we think of it kind of like uh, the ocean, so there's the ocean beer, it's been around 12,000 years and, and beers or beer styles are like the waves that come and go. Um, uh, I, I thought when I created the original beer Bible, I was really trying to focus on the ocean more than the waves. I wanted to try to create a, a, a book that would be fairly evergreen. Um, and in the you know short period of time, uh, it it was really cool. It's been six years by publication date. It's really been closer to eight years by uh, manuscript <laughs> dates because uh, of how long it took them to publish the first edition. Um, but in that eight year period, um, you know a bunch of stuff 
happened. And I, I guess we all know about IPA. So that was the real impetus to write the second edition. Um, the phrase hazy IPA did not appear in the first edition. Um, so then of course, milkshake IPA and all, all the others didn't appear there. Um, and it gave me an opportunity to try to figure out what IPAs are and break them down and, and write a chapter. Um, I'm curious to see if there's any people have any comment on that chapter because I did try to uh, capture IPAs in a chapter, you know, that's current to right now, <laughs> which in 10 years, uh, it won't be current. Um, and just, you know, talk about uh, the difference between haze and juice and all, all those things. Um, so I, I, I'm curious to see what people think of that. But the other thing is um, that I hadn't really considered as much is that styles die pretty fast. And, uh, you know, so <laughs> we keep in mind that in 2011, um, before 2011, in like 2010, uh, the best selling craft style was uh, pale ale and had been for, I don't know, forever. And only in 2011 did IPAs become the best selling craft style. So, you know, it's only a 10 year window, which still blows my mind. It still seems inconceivable that IPAs have only been the most popular American craft style that, in that period of time. Um, but when, when, when beers like that come online, it means other beers that are more obsolete and especially are counter trend are not like the hot new styles. Uh, they kind of die off. And um, so like, uh, I combined brown ale and mild ale because mild ales are basically extinct. There's a few examples in Britain, but even in Britain, I mean, it's really hard to find them. Um, I have I have seen one mild ale in the two trips I've spent doing research there. Uh, well, I've been there three three times in the last decade, and I've seen one one mild ale the whole time I was there. Um, they're just really rare. So it's a it's a it's an August style, you know. 75 years ago, it was one of the most important styles on the planet. It's basically gone. Another interesting one is, uh, is Whitbeer, you know, uh, that, that style 10 years ago was on the move. It was becoming a popular style. Um, and it was the best, the best selling, uh, craft style if you consider Blue Moon, but besides Blue Moon now, it's a pretty rare style. Um, and it seems like it's fallen way out of favor as, as fashions have changed. So I, I demoted that to just a, a subheading in my Belgian ale chapter. So those are just like three examples of, of demotions that, um, you know, I mean, I think styles that are, that are really fading fast. And, and, and I'm guessing that we'll see more styles die uh, in the next decade than we see new styles emerge. Um, so that's kind of sad. <laughs> is, there, is there an indication of what those styles may be, or at least what you feel like is threatened to fall into that category? I mean, old, old uh, American brew pub styles, uh, amber ales, red ales, those are, are pretty rare these days, harder to find. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, American wheat ale, um, some of those kind of really early styles are not super popular now. They're, they're styles that were built around malt rather than hops um, for a palate that is now you know, 35, 40 years out of date. Uh, I, I feel like um, there's a lot going on in the UK. Uh, so I, porters are not going to go away, but it's like really hard to find an American porter or a British porter. They're just really not very common anymore. I, hard, I find it hard to believe that they go away, but you know, dark ales in general are just not doing well in the world. Um, so there's that. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I think I, the, the thing is, it's really hard to predict because we're also, I'm looking at Jesse, uh, we also have craft malting. And I think that it is the most exciting and interesting trend that's happening in beer. And it, it actually has a chance to kind of reverse that trend and really open up a whole new vein of really fascinating stuff. It hasn't happened yet because craft maltsters don't produce enough malt to kind of, uh, you know, for, especially for larger breweries to switch over full time to base malts coming out of craft malt, malt houses. Um, but you could imagine it's not even, you know it's, it's it doesn't it doesn't require a great feat of imagination to think that malts could could become uh, a really interesting thing that the you know which we, we the haze bros become malt bros could happen 
I do want to just I want to I want to highlight that because uh, outside of you know Jesse and uh, Hannah Turner we had on a chat a while ago to talk about malting, and in the I don't know maybe ten chats that we've had since, um, the impact of craft malt specifically has been mentioned multiple times, uh, whether it is from brewers or people in the industry or people who cover the industry. Uh, there just seems to be something percolating there a little bit in terms of there it part of this next step of what could be. Why is it you think that's the case, Jeff? Well, you know, uh, among the many things that Americans didn't know about beer, um, and, and the list is really long, uh, you go back to the 1980s, Malt is a really big, big part of that. You know, all of the malting had been streamlined to produce industrial mass market lagers. And so base malts, nobody knew anything about base malts. Um, uh, even today, uh, if, if a person, if a brewery doesn't typically make, make lagers, if they're just making IPAs or, you know, kind of simple ales and you ask them about their malt, they won't have any idea what, what the, uh, the malt process is they just get it from a broker. Um, they'll probably almost always refer to it as two row, <laughs> which is really interesting because if you go to uh, other parts of the world, they'll tell you about the barley variety. They'll tell you about the malt house, how they like the malt prepared if they're not buying it off the shelf, which many are not. Um, so, you know, that's, that's a massive uh, difference between the United States and, and the rest of the, the world. But we're finally starting to see um, Americans get into malt and, and you know I think par part of the paucity of information there and sort of experience is that people think base malts only matter if you're making a cask ale or a, a hellas or something like that and they haven't seen the way in which if you use a different malt in your hazy IPA the same biochemistry that transforms uh, you know beers in all the ways will transform that beer if you use a different base malt uh, for your hazy beers and they haven't really gotten into that stuff and experimented uh, for the most part. But I think that, that that's probably the biggest potential thing that could transform uh, the industry is once people realize that malt affects every beer they make, um, and it may not be in the way that they think of malts, like I want it to be more bready, but rather the way that the sweetness resonates with the esters, resonates with the terpenes, all that stuff changes the flavor profile, um, then that will be, that could be a moment when, when Americans really get into malt for the first time. Um, I'm going to jump into some questions that we've had submitted, but before I do that, I've, I've got one more just because while we're on the topic, uh, I half jokingly asked this question. This is a story that ran in Punch uh, just last week. The anti-IPA is having a moment. Uh, the anti-IPA in this case is rock beer. Um, it's, uh, Justin Kennedy, who wrote the article, po points to a, a few things suggesting that uh, smoked smoked beer uh, is um, rising in popularity uh, and has great opportunity here. Um, I don't know if that's actually the case or not so much as I would just want to use that as a jumping off point, Jeff, to kind of build on all of what you just said. Um, when you think about, you know, IPA is kind of the monster of its own sitting on top of its throne, and then it's kind of everything else kind of figuring its way out. When we think about what, you know, the anti-IPA is in terms of something that's drawing attention, uh, this might be something whether you're just noticing uh, in terms of your travels around the country right now, uh, or in your normal day-to-day -day reporting, is there something you feel like kind of fits that bill appropriately in terms of the anti-IPA? Yeah, I, I definitely want to say that IPAs are the American style, and they're going to be around for um, decades to come uh, in, in the same way that, uh, you know, classic styles from other countries uh, delighted people uh, and, and, and kind of narrowed the field for other styles so that, you know, when you go to Bavaria, people drink Hellas and Dunkel and, and then a few other styles in the margins, but they don't drink triples and they don't drink IPAs. Um, that process is happening in the United States and it's happening with IPAs. And as much as people who don't love IPAs or don't want IPAs all the time uh, complain about them, 
I just, that is not going to go away. There's like no precedent in history that I can see <laughs> that would support the idea that that would be going away, especially uh, given how long um, the, the, the kind of development of hoppy beers has been going on. But um, we are Americans and unusually uh, we, we have a kind of, we do have that melting pot phenomenon happening where we welcome things from other parts of the world. Uh, and so we're always looking for a little bit of variety. Um, you know, <clears throat> when I was traveling through Bavaria, I was shocked at how hard it was to find any food that wasn't Bavarian. Like Bavarians eat Bavarian food and that's really all they eat. Try to even find a salad, very hard. Uh, <laughs> um, but in the United States, you know, if you're in any, any, any town of any size, you're gonna be able to find, you know, a Chinese restaurant. Um, on my side of the country, a Mexican restaurant for sure, uh, you know, various, various things. So my guess is um, the, there's the, there's the IPA ball uh, of, of beers and that's probably like 50 or hoppy ales. Uh, that's like 50% of the volume right now, I'm guessing in the craft sphere. Um, and then there's everything else. And it's curious what you asked, Brian, because that everything else that's the one thing I think I learned from this trip was, was that if you want to find, re everybody's making the, on the hoppy side, you don't really find very many different beers. Like people are all making the same kind of beer, but it's the everything else. That's where the regionalism is coming from. And that's what's super interesting. Um, you know, in, in um, Chicago and uh, Minneapolis, loggers are doing quite nicely. Um, you find most breweries there have loggers. There, there are logger-only breweries in both towns. But in Madison, Wisconsin, which you would think Wisconsin, they should have a big logger thing going on there. Uh, not super popular. People are really, it's that, they, they constitute a pretty small percentage of that other 50% thing. Um, when, when I was in Atlanta, uh, I toured a brewery called Bold Monk and they wanted to do Belgian ales and they didn't think that they would be very successful. Um, so they had other plans for other stuff. But uh, once their beer got into dis distribution, the distributor was finding that their quad, blows my mind, was really popular and they were selling a ton of quads. They're now selling 5,000 barrels of beer uh, and uh, the quad and the triple are their two big sellers. But then I went to Charlotte uh, and toward, uh, I had my event at Sugar Creek. They also uh, love Belgian ales and, and Joe Vogelbacher, the, the founder there, he really wanted to get into that stuff. That's sort of what made his heart sing. And the opposite happened. People, he pushed them and nobody went for it. So now he's selling a lot more IPAs. Uh, so that's, those are just cities, you know, I don't, I can't speak more broadly for larger regions within North Carolina and, and Georgia, but within those cities, there, there is, you know, clearly something quite different happening. And that's, that's interesting. And, and of course, I'm looking at Kate, who wrote that fantastic article, which I'm afraid very few people got to read because it was a print only uh, Montana article about uh, weird, the weird phenomenon of the popularity of Scotch ale in Montana. So you do see, I, I'm sure that uh, Montanans are still drinking a lot of IPAs also, but um, but in addition to the IPAs, there, yeah, and Jesse's there too, aren't you? You're in, you're in Montana. So you got the, the, the weird Scottish thing going on. So that's weird. Uh, but well, I will say that there is no chance on earth, no matter how hard John Hall pushes it, my good friend John Hall, that Rauch beer is ever going to be a thing. People do not like smoky flavors. It is not happening. <laughs> Uh, for real-time context in IRI data that's chain retailed nationally, IPA about 38% of dollars, the number two uh, style pale ale, 11%. Uh, so there is a significant uh, space between IPA as the number one uh, and the number two. Um, I want to, I'm going to jump to some of the questions that we got submitted. So Jeff, we'll do a, maybe a little bit of rapid fire jumping around, but uh, this one was asked uh, both uh, Gail and Kate had, had asked some version of this um, in terms of who is buying the book or who is the ideal reader? Is this, you know, someone who's adding it to their beer library of which I, I have behind me? Uh, is this someone who's just maybe supposed to be starting out and figuring out what beer is? Like, who is this person? 
I love this question because uh, for the first edition, the publisher really targeted it toward people who didn't know anything about beer. Um, and it's that that's actually a really tough market, uh, but they did a really good job. And because of the nature of the book, they did really well and it sold well. The problem was all my hard work, I spent so much time trying to make that book comprehensive and useful to people like me. Uh, I was really disappointed to find that nobody in the industry or beer geeks had ever read it because they thought it was like a, you know, a tra training wheels guide to book, like basically a different version of, of beer for dummies. And so, uh, so this, this trip, I, and, 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 and as I'm working, I, I, I asked them not to pitch it that way. Uh, we worked a long time on the cover design to try to emphasize that, um, it was not that way. There's a little blurb at the top that talks about most comprehensive book or something like that. So um, anyway, I'm trying. I'm trying to get people who who know a lot about beer to check it out because it's a, it, I, I hope I believe it's a reference guide that will be useful to anybody who has questions like, uh, you know, when when were porters first? Like, I can't. Which century did porters start in? Or um, you know, the grist for. Uh, 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 Weizen beer is that like 40% wheat or 80%? I can't remember. Like you know these kinds of questions, which beginners are not going to ask, right? There, there's a bunch of really detailed stuff in there um, that I spent a crazy and almost divorce-causing amount of time trying to track down. And um, I wish people, I wish other people besides newbies would look at it because it's, it, it, I think it's a good guide for that. Jeff, I, I, you've you've said you might die. You've said the book may have caused a potential divorce. Uh, all of which are jokes. I know. Um, I, like I do want to I do want to sit with that for a second just to give context because like this is not a small book, nor is it an easy undertaking. Um, is there a simple way for us to understand what it takes to create something like this? Well, so I've written several books now, and this book is a real outlier in terms of, you know, the other ones were more, I, I could, I had a work-life balance with the other one. Um, this one was, was just, it was crazy. Um, it, it, it was, it, I'm really glad that uh, it was the first book I got to write uh, because it was like getting a graduate degree in, in, in beer studies. Um, I had to learn so much and that has been enormously beneficial. You know, it's paid such dividends down the line. Uh, it, you know, when I'm writing any article, I already have so much info in my, in my tank that I can just re refer to. So it's, it's super helpful. Uh, but in terms of um, the, the project of creating it, it is a crazy book. Um, if you try to encompass the, the knowledge of beer uh, in one book. Um, it, it's, 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 it's a real challenge to be both comprehensive and brief enough that it's a use, usable book. Um, and you, you know, I felt kind of responsible to have accurate information in there so that uh, um, it, you know, it, if I got fact checked by Ron Pattinson or Martin Cornell or Brewers, um, uh, people who have technical knowledge that I didn't know about, growers, uh, folks like that, that it wouldn't be a laughably bad, you know, example of a writer just making it up as he went along. And there are a lot of books out there like that. So um, I always felt like it kind of gave me a neurosis because I was trying to capture the best information in the subject, but I was trying to cover all the subjects. So I had to have all the best information in history, all the best information in science, all the best information. Uh, in terms of like aesthetics and technical stuff, I had to try to figure out which beers to use as examples uh, for all these things. And um, that was just, so I, I constantly felt like, obviously I don't know as much as professional brewers do. I can't ever go that deeply. Um, and even if I could, I wouldn't be able to be as knowledgeable about beer uh, as all the brewers, right? So like I might learn what a, an American brewer knows, but I wouldn't know what a Lambic brewer knows. I wouldn't know what a lager brewer in Bavaria knows. Like this is impossible. So I constantly had this feeling of <laughs> thinking that um, I was getting stuff wrong, um, which, which was really challenging 
uh, emotionally as I was trying to finish that book. So, yeah. well, it, it, and it it's reported. I think is the way that in my head when you say that that's what I hear is that you don't know something you go out and learn about it you do your best to double check triple check make sure it's right because this is ends up being the word of record you had mentioned in your on your blog that of about 230,000 words in this book which is 644 pages about 600 of which are the content uh, the last portion being your glossary, bibliography, all of that as well. This is large. Um, about 50,000 of those words this time around were new. And that was something that Ben wanted to know more about in terms of updating or revising sections. What was the most challenging and why? Well, uh, it, was, it, was, it was really uh, dealing with America. Um, in the first edition, I had a chapter on American ale, which included basically those old obsolete styles, which you won't really find written about in much depth in this one. So like red ales, amber ales, wheat ales, all that stuff. Um, I had a chapter on IPA, but there was a whole bunch of uh, like stuff about Britain and kind of old history stuff, which, which I think I mostly included. Um, it's a, the, the current IPA chapter is really long. Uh, but it but it didn't go into all the depth and detail that that I needed to do uh, to kind of catch us up on IPAs. And then there was a another chapter on on strong ales, like mostly hoppy ales, like you know, but like double IPAs and triple IPAs, that kind of thing. Um, and so that was no longer a workable way to think about it. So part of part of the challenge of a book like the Beer Bible is trying to figure out what makes sense in terms of organization. How do we we have all this in, we have all this stuff and how do we organize it to make it sensible so i dumped all three of those and just wrote a new chapter called hoppy american ales and because it's the most important beer style in the world right now um, in terms of you know what's animating the discussion and, and new brewery development um, and new beer style development across the or across the planet um, getting that right was was pretty important so I, I spent a lot of time figuring out how to put that together um, the other stuff was was fun, you know. Um, I didn't have sake in the first book. Um, I had it, but it was a, it was like yeah, a, a a small section, four or five paragraphs in a in a in a catch all chapter about minor styles. I felt gu really guilty about that the instant it went out, and uh, that the <laughs> I knew if I ever got to write a second edition, I was going to bump it up to a full chapter. I actually had to kind of debate the the, the uh, publisher with that. Um, they didn't want to do it. And I said, basically, you're, if I'm rewriting this, if we're doing this, we're having a chapter on sake. It's really important. And um, I don't care if nobody else reads it or cares about it. It's got to be in the book. Um, and then Lars Garshol's work on uh, on the, the farmhouse ales was also a really cool thing that happened in between them. So it was fun to um, travel to Vilnius uh, on, my, on my research trip and, and write a chapter about that, uh, relying, of course, heavily on on his work in, in Scandinavia, which I wasn't able to visit. Uh, I'm gonna pause here in case anybody wants to unmute themselves and ask Jeff a question yourself. So if you do, please feel free to chime in and ask away if you've got a question for Jeff. Otherwise I will continue on. I have another question. <laughs> Fire away, Kate. <laughs> uh, how did you physically organize well not physic i don't know digitally organize your writing for this like did you have google docs for different chapters like if you're updating them how does that work uh for the the for the first edition i i, I submitted it in two chunks so um my organization was two files <laughs> i just wrote it i just i just wrote it straight in the i had a i had a, a word file one thing that um, book publishers tend to like is not a lot of uh, 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 formatting. So one font, you can you can make them bigger uh, to kind of emphasize some stuff, and in in uh, and then they change that. They they convert it into this weird like header TK header X three four. And then like, I know what that means, but you, you can do a little bit of that to kind of describe your organizational style. But 
Um, I, you know, I wrote, I wrote the chapters more or less, uh, at, you know, one at a time. There were, there were times when I would go back and, uh, and they were mostly based on styles. Like most of the book is, is a style based structure. Um, so sometimes I would have to go back and revise or change, but, um, yeah, I just, uh, I just, I just started, I started at uh, the first style and then I, I, I went to the last one. I just wrote them straight through. Um, and, and also, you know, like as, as I'm researching, a lot of the research you can, you, you do, you go to the UK, so that's going to apply to more than one chapter. So I had a whole bunch of files, mostly digital files, uh, with info about British beer, German beer, whatever. Um, and so that, that, that exists on my, on my computer as well. I, do you have a I, I, I often, what's that? Do you have a physical notebook that you used a lot? Yeah. Uh, I, I audio recorded everything. Mm -hmm. So I have these great archives of uh, audio recordings. I took some notes, but mostly I, um, you know, when I was traveling, I had to try to take some photos as well as talk to a person and record them. And so trying to take notes was sort of impossible. Um, sometimes I would take notes like, uh, you know, uh, Hans Peter Drexler said something really important at, you know, and I would look at the, the date stamp and say, you know, make sure you catch this and just jot that down quickly. But um, uh, no, I didn't take a lot of physical notes. And then, and then that was a big challenge. I had to come back and I had all these wonderful uh, interviews, audio interviews that I had to transcribe. And they were like, you know, some were like three hours long and that was incredibly painful. Do you, did you use a service or did you do this yourself? I did it myself. Why was that helpful to you rather than sending it off? Well, it's because, uh, and I think everyone is going to recognize this who's, who's listening now. This was maybe not something that people uh, who don't write for a living would not recognize. But as you're talking to somebody, you are processing what they're saying. And there's always a slight lag, right? So they say something and it takes your brain a minute to process that. And meanwhile, they're still talking. And so it's, an, it's incredibly cool to go back and listen to the tapes because there's a whole bunch of stuff on there you didn't hear the first time. You literally didn't hear it. It's like, oh my God, he said that. That's so amazing. <laughs> so glad I have that. Um, you said that you were basically going to the mat to make sure sake was included in this edition. Why is sake so important? Here, I think one of the one of the reasons that we 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 have such a um, a problem with with thinking of beer as a white uh, and and sometimes male uh, thing is because we we really focus on Europe as the nexus of, of things that are beery. Um, but, you know, one of, one of the things that, that my, the way I think, I think about beer, it's impossible for me to think about beer as something other than a 12,000 year old beverage that's been brewed everywhere on the planet uh, out of every grain. You know, if there is a grain, people have made beer out of it. Um, my, the beer Bible is necessarily limited by covering commercial beer styles. So, you know, chicha, where there are, you, there are examples, you can, you can buy it commercially, but you can't necessarily buy it bottled. Um, Quas, the same thing. Like there's a bunch of styles out there that are semi-commercial, not really totally commercial. And I just have to those. Sake is not one of those beers. It is an incredibly old, important tradition. You can buy Japanese sake in your town right now, no matter what town it is. You may not be able to buy good sake, but you can buy it. <laughs> uh, there are hundreds, there, you know, there are uh, uh, breweries that are hundreds of years old. Um, I'm super into process and the, the process you have to go through to get rice to ferment is bizarre and amazing and super cool. So it is just this an incredible, national tradition uh, that's unlike anything else on the planet. And I wish more people knew about it. Whether or not you, you like that, that, beer, that, that beer style or not, it's, it's super trippy. And there's a, reading that chapter is kind of enlightening because, you know, for example, the yeast that they use to ferment sakes will, will typically ferments them to 20%, which when I first started writing about beer, uh, I was told was impossible, you know, 
Saccharomyces strains will crap out after 14. percent You just you, they they be, they become toxic to themselves after 14. percent um, So had I known then, I would have said, okay, what about sake? Because <laughs> they they can ferment it up to 20. percent So yeah, I think it's just a really important beer style, and um, it deserves. You know, I think there's there's a little bit of chauvinism uh, in us uh, as as the beer people not including it in one of the most important styles alongside Hellas or uh, cask bitter or other things. And, and, you know, millions of people drink it. Uh, I think uh, Jesse dropped the link. Uh, Jeff Gioletti, friend, who I think helped advise a little bit, maybe. I think you had referenced this, Jeff. Uh, uh, other Jeff uh, wrote the Sacopedia. Uh, what, was, what was it that, I guess, as you're kind of talking about the fascination here, that maybe we're all missing is it is it that history aspect is it because it's embedded in terms of ways that we don't talk about beer like what was it that first kind of got your curiosity to make sure that this was something that you paid attention to i mean i, I intuited that it was a, a big deal and an important deal and that i i, I, I it was a bit of uh cultural chauvinism not to have it in the first edition but i but, but that was more of a, a kind of gut feeling. It was, it was really Jeff who kind of helped me um, come along. We, we do have a, a sake brewery here in uh, Oregon called Sake One. And shortly after the first edition went off, or I don't know, anyway, after I finished, I can't remember how soon after, uh, whether it was the manuscript or whether it was out or whatever, but I went toward that brewery and that was super fascinating. And then Jeff, uh, Unsurprisingly, uh, one of the best places to drink sake in uh, North America is uh, here in in Oregon. Am I frozen? You're coming. Did I just freeze, you guys? There, there are just some pauses, just... but your audio is fine. Okay. <laughs> everybody, I noticed everybody was Kate turned around and then she didn't turn back around, and I thought, uh oh, this could be bad. <laughs> uh, Anyway, um, so Jeff is all the time coming to Portland because we have all these sake bars and this rich sake culture. So I started meeting up with him and um, tasting different sakes. And, you know, just like if you go to uh, any country in, in Europe where they have beer style, beer, you know, beer culture, there's different styles and they're made differently and they taste differently. And you got to know the language and all that stuff. And, you know, the way they pour it and they're just, it's just as rich as anything else. Um, mm. So he was a bit of a my guide, and uh, some of the photos in there came from him. He's credited, and he also uh, I sent that chapter off to him before before I sent it off to the publisher to make sure there were no major gaffes. So yeah, if there are major gaffes, we're both on the hook for that. <laughs> uh, we're going to go for maybe like ten more minutes, so I'm going to do one more call out uh, before I continue on questions that people had submitted. If you've got a question that you'd like to ask Jeff please feel free to unmute yourself and fire away. Otherwise I will continue on. Um, you're welcome to send me a message in the chat box or post it there if you have a question. Uh, Jeff, you, we are catching you in the midst of your nationwide tour. You've been doing this for a while. You're soon to finish up. Um, Gail wanted to know what's the oddest question that you've been asked as you've been traveling the country. Oh man. So you asked it, but now we have to remember what did you ask me? It was the first question you asked, or the second, or it was a question you oh it was no, it was a question you asked on the podcast. What was that question? I I will repeat it. Uh this will be a tease. So um uh, Jeff uh, and I recorded a podcast episode for the Good Beer Hunting podcast. Uh, and the first question I asked Jeff had been rattling around my brain for weeks. So uh, Jeff had alluded to the amount of time between the first and second edition coming out. A lot had changed in terms of the beer world. Uh, like we had mentioned, about a fifth of the book had been rewritten in terms of the updates and the revisions. And so the question I asked Jeff, and you are welcome to answer again and build on, I think what you shared with me here was, how have you changed in the years since the first book came out and the second edition is released? Ah, uh, yes, that was, uh, <laughs> that was a <laughs> very Brian question. Uh, yeah, I mean, you get, uh, just to say why, why that question was interesting to me, to me is because, uh, 
when you do media events, uh, you know, you talk to the media for a book like this, um, you tend to hear the same questions over and over, and over again. Um, you know, maybe, maybe you don't hear identical questions, but there's probably like 20 questions, uh, some version of which, you know, like five, you know, five to eight, every reporter asks and not all the same, but um, they fall within those 20 questions. So that was a, a, an unusual question. The number of times I, I didn't just have it ready to, you know, I didn't have a, an answer dialed up. Um, uh, that was yours was the only time that happened. I can't remember what I said because you really caught me off guard. Um, so it'll be curious to uh, listen to that again. I, 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 and consistency is also not my great strength. Um, I, you know, if you ask me one day what I think about a thing, I'll give you an extremely strong uh, opinion and then the next day I'll, I'll probably contradict myself. So when people get into my archives and said, but you said, eh, I'm terrible <laughs> about that. Well, uh, yeah, little did I know that uh, the tease of asking that question was always gonna be a tease for you, Jeff, to listen back to our conversation when that goes <laughs> live. Um, let's maybe focus on that too, because all of us here, we are so often asking questions, you as well, and you've just spent a considerable amount of time and you still will in the coming weeks um, being asked questions. Are there things that you've picked up, like the repetition, for example, in terms of, you know, takeaways that maybe you've seen as someone who asks questions, who is now being asked? asked questions that is maybe uh, helping you think about ways to ask questions differently or approach interviews or conversations in a different way when you're trying to gather information? I mean, I guess the thing that I observed was that, you know, people often don't have a lot of bandwidth for the stories they're writing. Uh, these days. And so they ask the obvious superficial questions, um, which are fine. And, you know, like a good politician, I can take any question and offer an answer, the answer that I want with <laughs> really even gesturing to the question so much. Um, I had, you know, I, I, had, I had a narrative I really wanted to direct people to with the book. So I would just use those questions that way. Um, there were really very few times when somebody would ask me something that was kind of probing and unusual. Um, so to the extent that I learned anything, I guess it's that you should probably try to um, look for the angle on the story that's not the most obvious. Uh, and, you know, like think, maybe draw up your list of, of questions and then, um, and then think about the whole thing again and, and figure out is there a way to talk to this person that doesn't just cover those the really obvious questions. Um, I mean, as a writer, I try to do that too. I, I do try to find, we, we all, you know, there's so many breweries. Um, there, are, there, are, there are now a number of writers, uh, there's social media. So we're all trying to figure out a way to tell a story that will be engaging to readers. Um, and I'm always trying to figure out a way to, you know, kind of get a, a slightly unusual take on things. So I guess don't be obvious is the thing that I took away. Um, Jeff, I'm looking at the glossary of your book right now. Uh, I'm looking under H, searching for hard seltzer, uh, which does not appear in the glossary. Um, this I'm kind of building off. Gail was curious about styles or beers that people are excited about on the horizon. Um, in, a, in a book in which you explore fermentation outside of beer, uh, why was hard seltzer not a part of your exploration? I mean, I have a, I feel like I have a liberal definition of beer, but uh, I do have a definition of beer. Um, it, it should be, uh, I feel like beer is a craft uh, in which a whole grain is taken and turned into uh, an a lightly alcoholic beverage through process. And um, it, from my perspective, seltzer is an, is an interesting uh, product. Uh, but I don't also, I also don't talk about hard lemonade and I don't talk about, um, you know, a bunch of other uh, adjacent alcoholic beverages because I feel like I, 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 I don't want to be one of those old guys who says, get off my lawn about other beverages. But on the other hand, I feel like it's worth 
uh, defending the craft of brewing that I encountered when I went out and talked to some of the practitioners who had spent their lifetimes mastering it. And that those people, um, it, you do not have to do that to make cider or seltzer, right? You, you, you can master seltzer. Um, seltzer is, is, a, is, a, is a process of chemistry. It's not a process of craft. Um, and it doesn't include some of the hallmarks that I would consider uh, important, you know, important in defining what, what a beer is. So while I'll have sake in my book, I, I feel like seltzer is a bridge too far. Uh, I'm going to do one more question, but I will do one last chance in case there's anybody who wants to push Jeff on hard seltzer and why it's not in the book. Uh, <laughs> please feel free to unmute yourself. I'll give you a I'm, I am curious. You guys should all back channel me whether that was a good answer or not. I'm, I'm curious what you all, how you were all doing <laughs> seltzer. That was, a, that was a high hard one there, uh, Brian. A little chin <laughs> music for me. I appreciate that. I've got, I've got it in print, Jeff, uh, or lack thereof, I guess, really is the point here. Um, does anybody, anybody want to ask about ranch water or a hard seltzer real quick before? <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Um, Jeff, I, I appreciate you sharing all of this, uh, especially you've already shared so much of your time with people around the country. Uh, so doing it here, I hope people are taking things away. I think there's been a handful of things uh, we talked about, you know, the aspect of malt and what that might do for dying styles. Um, you know, the way to ask questions. I think that's valuable takeaway too. Um, we had a question that was submitted. Um, we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit because they want to know about the third edition of the Beer Bible, effectively, um, which was, you know, it has not been a long time since you've released the second edition. Uh, but the question was about what you've learned since you maybe handed in that manuscript that would go in, or at least you're already thinking about what would be appropriate to explore for the third edition? Yeah, fortunately, the, the publication of this book was a lot faster than the other one. So I turned the manuscript in in um, early 2020, to, uh, like March 2020 or something like that. So we, we got to publish relatively faster books. So um, and, and there was a global pandemic. So that really kind of slowed things down in terms of change. I mean, one thing, um, I don't know. The answer, the answer is, I don't know. I, I could, I could envision that, uh, uh, I wouldn't need to write anything that, that this book will stand as a, as a decent reference for another decade. Um, but, 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 but the counterbalancing thing is, uh, as a blogger, uh, I, I have always worried, I actually don't worry about this anymore, but for the first decade I was writing my blog, I worried that uh, the subject would become repetitive, that I would start to repeat myself and, you know, like how many times can I write about Porter? Uh, and what I learned is that it doesn't, you know, so much changes that, that and you don't predict it, you know, um, five years ago, I certainly didn't know that I would be asked about seltzer when I was talking about the beer Bible. Um, and, and that is a million, a million things like that. There's something, there's always something new to explore and write about. So we were really fortunate uh, that we selected this subject because there are other subjects that are a lot more static and you, I think you do necessarily fall into repetition. So I, I feel extremely fortunate that the subject I've you know, fallen into writing about, and it really <laughs> was no master plan. It really was more accidental. Um, I'm really glad that I, this was the one, the hole I accidentally fell into. It turns out it's a wonderful hole. Well, uh, we're happy to, uh, to be exploring this with you, Jeff. We're glad that you fell down that rabbit hole. Um, Jeff, thank you very much for sharing your time tonight. Everybody, thank you very much for being here. Uh, if you've got any questions to follow yes. up, uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey Thank <there>. you guys. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> uh, if you have any questions to follow up uh, with Jeff or uh, anybody else here, uh, you scroll up right now is your time to do so in the chat box with the, uh, the social accounts. Otherwise, uh, we will see you again on November 27th when we chat with Holly Reagan about Holly's reporting on imposter syndrome uh, and what that means for women in beer. Um, thanks everybody for joining. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you all. Great to see you. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> thanks, Brian. See you guys again.
Bye, everybody. <laughs>